be a presentation. But unless there is any any uh, of you against uh, it being recorded. And um, I will immediately uh, start by sharing. Let me know if you can all see uh, my presentation. Good. Uh, so um, we will follow this agenda. So first of all, a brief introduction, a very brief introduction about what virtual exchange is all about and about us, uni collaboration. And then I'll focus on the bespoke training options. I am outreach officer and project manager, as well as co-trainer for uni collaboration. Uh, then I will be followed by uh, Anna Bevan, uh, who is a uh, one of our lead trainers at Uni Collaboration, and she will introduce you to open for all training courses um, uh, that, that uh, regard and include both the introduction to virtual exchange and the virtual exchange project design courses. Uh, then Teresa McKinnon, um, board member and responsible for communication for Uni Collaboration, will outline what open badges are and Lorenza Baccino, one of our qualified facilitators and trainers, will focus on facilitation in virtual exchange. I will then try to briefly hint at what you can do in the current call for proposals in terms of activities to be planned for virtual exchange within that call. And we then leave uh, 20 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, welcome to those who have just joined us. Uh, I um, just remind you of keeping your mic uh, switched off and of collecting and posing your questions and use the chat to pose your questions so that we can we can deal with them at the end of our presentation this presentation is being recorded and uh, okay let's let's move on to a brief a very brief introduction about virtual exchange and uni collaboration so uni collaboration who are we uh, we are a cross-disciplinary professional organization and not-for-profit organization dealing with virtual exchange in the field of higher education. We are um, quite recent. Um, the organization was founded in, founded in, in April 2016. Um, and uh, it, the main aims and targets of the organization of uni collaboration are to promote the development and integration of research and practice in telecollaboration and virtual exchange across all disciplines and subject areas in higher education. And the second aim is to be active and actively engage in awareness raising of telecollaboration and virtual exchange at institutional and policy making level. So uh, to respond to those aims, we organize biannual conferences on virtual exchange, regular publication and research on it. We uh, liaise with um, policy bodies and with organizations and networks uh, to promote these innovative pedagogy at higher education level. And uh, here, as you may have noticed, I have used the two terms to describe, to um, refer to virtual exchange, telecollaboration and virtual exchange. But to make things even more complicated, you may, and I'm sure you have come across one of these terms, COIL, International Virtual Classroom, Global Classroom, Online Intercultural Exchange, Global Learning Experience, Global Network Learning, Virtual Mobility. They are all used, and here I, mean, I need to um, specify a few things afterwards. More or less, they are all used to define and describe similar activities with one exception, virtual mobility. So let me just um, differentiate virtual mobility from all the rest of the terms you see here. And now we will here focus on virtual exchange because um, I mean, this is terminology being used even after and based on, on the Erasmus Plus virtual exchange initiative. So being used within the European context. So I will here differentiate virtual exchange from virtual mobility. And since I like using images, I would like you to consider virtual mobility as the overarching umbrella under which you may find virtual exchange as a specific path to be taken in the field of virtual mobility. Now, let's then focus on what virtual exchange is. And I would like to offer you this 
uh, description. So virtual exchange, you can consider virtual exchange as a sequence of people to people dialogues, which are sustained over a period of time and enabled by technology. So the use of media platforms is made in virtual exchange to enable this deep interactive social learning. And um, technology is, is a tool through which virtual exchange takes place. You, you should see virtual exchange as an innovative pedagogy where interaction plays a key role. And these interactions are facilitated by qualified facilitators, as Lorenza here, to ensure that they are meaningful. These have been developed over 30 years of experience in the field of intercultural in, in educational exchange and study abroad. Last but not least, virtual exchange is not an alternative to physical mobility. It is complementary to physical mobility as it deepens, expands, extends physical exchange and very frequently prepares to the physical exchange itself and even uh, fuels new demand for physical exchange. It is aimed, we can summarize its aims um, as follows. First of all, to allow for a more inclusive approach to an intercultural experience, as it allows an increasing number of people to have this meaningful intercultural experience as part of their education, be it formal or not formal. Second aim, promote reciprocity and allow for equity and inclusiveness. It's a scalable approach, which can reach out to those who would not otherwise consider a physical mobility. It is also aimed to increase mutual understanding, global citizenships and digital and media literacy, as well as to develop soft and employability skills, such as digital competence, foreign language and communication skills, the ability to work in a diverse cultural context and teamwork. Now let's focus on what virtual exchange is not, and let us differentiate virtual exchange from other forms of online learning in this table. So in the case of virtual exchange, the emphasis is on the dialogue, then on the people-to-people -people intercultural dialogue, whereas other forms of online learning focus on the online access, and the main aim is to provide the educational content to learners, whereas in virtual exchange, um, interactions are guided and educators and facilitators have this role of guiding interaction between peers uh, in different locations. This means that intercultural learning is one of the main educational outcomes, in addition to course content, and most is done synchronously, whereas in the case of other forms of online learning, mastery of course content plays a key role and communication is predominantly asynchronous. That said, what does UniCollaboration do? We are expert in training courses on virtual exchange, and these training options can take two different shapes, either bespoke training courses, which I will briefly describe here, and or open world training courses, which Anna will describe to you after uh, afterwards. So bespoke training courses. These are specifically designed for requesting higher education institutions or higher education networks and are aimed at both teaching and administrative staff or at the top management, depending on the content. In this case, the content is customized to address a specific context and needs. Uh, we can uh, offer specific topics modules upon request, such as intercultural learning, assessment, technology, or specific topics like virtual exchange for business, healthcare, these are just examples. Possible formats. Um, bespoke training options are very, very flexible. So we have institutions asking for asynchronous training courses, bespoke asynchronous training courses with weekly Zoom meetings. But most of the institutions which opt for bespoke training courses ask for synchronous courses, meaning a sequence of webinars or online uh, workshops. The most adopted formula is the four by four training course, meaning four modules, four days. Each module is uh, lasts four hours approximately. So it means four half a days. This is the module which is 
um, mostly appreciated. Or we can even offer individual mentoring hours for educators launching their first virtual exchange projects. Just to give you an idea, uh, as of 2019, we have trained through the bespoke training options, we have trained over, we have offered over 32 bespoke training courses to uh, 19 institutions in Europe and, and uh, in the US, uh, training over 450 participants. And you, here you see uh, the names of the institutions we have been working with, some of these names. And I would like you to bear in mind that these are just the bespoke training options and the full training options. Uh, but we also provide webinars or workshops for those institutions, for example, willing to offer a continuous professional development option for their staff, but not having much time available for their staff to uh, go for a full training course. But I'll stop here and I'll leave the floor to Anna uh, for the um, open to all training courses option. Okay, thank you, Sarah. So um, there are two types of uh, training options that are open to all. These run three times a year. The first one is what we call the Introduction to Virtual Exchange Training Course. Um, this course is designed for those who have little or no experience of virtual exchange. They want to know a little bit more about it, how it works, what it involves, um, some of the challenges. Um, and uh, it's aimed at both educators um, and also administrative and technical staff in higher education, because of course, virtual exchange um, is very often organized by the educators, but it absolutely needs the support um, of administrative and technical staff as well. Um, there are also people working, for example, in internationalization offices who attend the course because they want to understand a little bit more how to sell it to their teachers, for example, uh, within their institutions. Uh, the course format is four weeks. It takes place in English, used as a lingua franca. Um, the materials, the assignments, all the uh, asynchronous activities take place on an online platform. Um, and we have weekly 90 minute video meetings via Zoom. So once a week, uh, four in total um, throughout the course. Uh, these uh, give uh, the opportunity to discuss what has been done during the week. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it's, it's part of the, um, part of the, the learning is, is through the synchronous session. We also organize these courses to feel a little bit like a virtual exchange itself. So um, the participants get the feeling of what their students will experience by doing a virtual exchange. In terms of workload, the commitment is about four hours a week, including the four synchronous sessions. Um, so, but obviously um, two and a half hours will be done asynchronously, so they can be done when you're free. Um, over to the next slide, please, Sarah. Uh, in terms of the contents, so we have four weeks, we said. Week one is about getting to know uh, other participants. This is very much what your students will be doing during their first week of virtual exchange. We talk about online presence, about digital skills, and specifically about netiquette. Uh, in week two, uh, we go into detail as to what virtual exchange is and the different models of virtual exchange. In other words, what we call the ready-made model um, and the teacher-designed model. Uh, and we offer different examples of virtual exchange projects that have been carried out uh, to give you an idea of the kinds of things that can be done through virtual exchange. In week three, we look at the pedagogical principles, but also the technology, the technological tools that you can use in your virtual exchange. And we also discuss stakeholders, in other words, who needs to be involved in the virtual exchange to be um, successful. Um, we also discuss ways of finding partners in case you don't have a partner. Um, and then in week four, we look at some of the challenges uh, and how to preempt those challenges, how to anticipate them and preempt them. Um, and then there's a reflection on the entire course. So we saw earlier, Sarah, Sarah explained that the courses can be uh, bespoke. We can off also offer this course as a bespoke training. Um, the bespoke are designed specifically for your higher education institutions. So 
they are good if you already have a partner in mind. However, if you don't, then the open door may be uh, more suitable for you because it's the best way to, of finding partners. Sometimes um, uh, participants uh, taking part in the course find each other as potential partners and then decide to go on and develop their own virtual exchange together. So uh, this is the ideal place to, to find a partner. Over to the next. So uh, after you've uh, done the introduction to virtual exchange, we offer you also the virtual exchange project design. Uh, now this time, this is you don't actually have to have done the introduction to virtual exchange. If you already know something about virtual exchange, you can go straight into the project design. Uh, it's designed for those who already have an understanding of virtual exchange, but who need help designing their project. It's aimed primarily at educators because they will be the ones designing the actual virtual exchange project. But um, if there are administrative and technical staff directly involved in that design, then we encourage them to attend as well to understand how they will be able to support you. Um, we also uh, encourage both partners to be involved in the training because a virtual exchange is always designed together. Um, and so uh, it makes sense that both partners take part in the training and design, we do the tasks together. The course format is five weeks, one week longer than the, the introduction course. Again, the materials, assignments, the synchronous activities take place on the online platform with, again, weekly 90 minute video meetings via Zoom. <clears throat> Sorry, I put four in total. It's five in total, of course, because it's one a week. Um, and the commitment is a little bit higher than uh, for the introductory course, perhaps more four to five hours a week, including the synchronous session, because of course, all the tasks uh, require you also to design your own project. Um, the contents that you can see, uh, week one, similar, getting to know the other participants in the course, and a very brief introduction to the course and to what virtual exchange is, um, looking at examples of virtual exchanges that may be of inspiration to you. In week two, uh, you begin with the end, so basically with establishing the learning goals, what you want your learners to, to be able to achieve through the virtual exchange. Then in week three, looking at crafting your collaborative tasks and your activities that will lead uh, to your learners attaining those goals. In week four, we look at the technology to support your VE because you need to start with the pedagogy. The technology needs to support your pedagogical um, practice, not the other way around. So you don't start with the tools, you start with the learning. Um, and in week five, you finish developing your project and we discuss also successful partnerships and what it takes for the partnership to work. So that's basically the content of the project design. Um, over to Teresa to briefly talk about badges. Thank you, thanks very much. Um, so as you can understand really by listening to both Sara and Anna there, virtual exchange is a challenging activity. It's often cross institutional, it crosses borders, it crosses silos within an institution, it involves collaboration and co-creation. It's an innovative activity. So if you're going to put a lot of effort into that sort of activity, um, personally, I, I led virtual exchange uh, for 10 years in my institution, you need to be you need to have that effort recognized and uni collaboration was one of the consortium partners with Erasmus plus virtual exchange in developing over a three year period um, an implementation of uh, really spreading the word and normalizing virtual exchange as a way of connecting students across those borders and indeed connecting staff. Um, and Miriam Hauk and myself spent some time investigating the use of um, something called open badges, which is, a, again, critically aligned with that innovative um, way of addressing and recognizing uh, pedagogical challenge, and interest in, uh, in learning and expanding your uh, horizons. So what we looked at was how would Open Badges support uh, the work that you do in virtual exchange and how could it help 
our participants to be recognized for the effort that they've made. Um, and if you have a QR code on your phone, you'll be able to scan that little QR code in the bottom there to see what we came up with for the Erasmus Plus virtual exchange in terms of uh, looking at the skills that it develops and recognizing the various milestones along the way. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So post Erasmus Plus virtual exchange, uni collaboration continues to support uh, the development and implementation of virtual exchange with our own suite of badges. Um, earners can use these and collect them. Open badges are essentially, and I'll give you some links here that you can uh, take with you and uh, investigate further. Essentially, they are digital ways of recognizing experiences and expertise that the earner then can um, curate and use on their profiles, maybe on LinkedIn or their website or wherever they want to share and show their skills um, in order to support them in their professional development, whether that's a teacher or a student. Um, and currently, uh, Uni Collaboration is doing lots and lots of um, innovative work in the use of open badges for virtual exchange because it's so important to us that we have this critical alignment between the nature of the activity that we nurture in virtual exchange and the nature of this assessment or uh, recognition system that we offer. Um, so there's so much here that I couldn't possibly go into detail um, today, but I'm providing you with some further links. So perhaps if we could do the next slide, Sarah, please. Um, some easy publications for you to grab, particularly the second one there, which is a very short, um, readable, I hope, um, explanation of how open badges work that you can uh, download and see why they have made a contribution to supporting um, the work that we do. A short guide really, and hopefully some of you here may have heard of people sharing their open badges, and we're very keen to listen to and hear just how people have used them. Um, the learning analytics that we can gauge from the use of um, open badges helps us to understand which courses are um, popular and used and how our learners have progressed in curating their online profiles um, as they move through their careers. So thank you, that's me, that's all I have to offer at the moment on open badges. Thank you, um, Teresa. So facilitation in virtual exchange, what is it and how it fits into VE? Well, you're, hang, hang on one second, Sarah, just a moment, <laughs> that's it. Your, we find that virtual exchanges typically last between four to eight weeks. Most probably it will consist of asynchronous and synchronous activities. So you as tutors will do some synchronous meetings with your students, maybe in the form of a tutorial session where you'll focus more on the content of your exchange. An online facilitated dialogue session or OFD is, is different. These are synchronous sessions and should take place more than once to get the full benefit. And if you choose to use them and include an external facilitator, it's recommended they be included as an integral part of your project and therefore should be managed by external facilitators who aren't necessarily familiar with the content or discipline of your exchange, but rather focus on the process of getting your students to collaborate effectively with each other and build relationships by developing curiosity in their peers. But what are facilitators in this context and why use them? Next slide, Sara, thanks. So facilitators are trained in specific skills. They can help participants to engage with difference, to communicate and to learn together and, and from each other. So facilitators aren't tutors and not experts in the content of your virtual exchange necessarily. So they're there to encourage the participants to build relationships, to be curious and have that growth mindset. So we can help them prepare for the tasks ahead that are set by the tutors. And we find that by exploring their own identity and that of other participants, they begin to engage more constructively with, with difference. So we ensure, the facilitators ensure that all your participants are heard as individuals and hopefully 
help to break down stereotypes. In fact, this is a very popular topic of discussion and often leads to deep exploration of identity and culture. So as facilitators, we typically meet with the tutor to discuss your virtual exchange in general and decide the content and structure of the sessions. But facilitators are neutral in the process, and this is key as it frees up the participants to discuss openly and without judgment. This, this is the difference. So facilitated sessions are therefore not tutorials, but rather opportunities for participants to dig deeper and agree or disagree without being judged, but in a safe space with respect and, and tolerance. So facilitators aren't there to impose values or to try and change values, but rather to explore why people think the way they do and to listen to each other. So online facilitated dialogue sessions are useful tools to keep up momentum of your virtual exchange. So we typically recommend more than one, perhaps three, one at the beginning to kickstart your project and get to know each other, one in the middle to see how the collaboration's going and one at the end as a reflection exercise. So we have our tools and activities we use to adapt to different contexts. Um, next slide, please, Sara. So this is me involved in a lovely exchange with Venice International University, where, as you can see, this group is very diverse. India, Nigeria, China, Italy, Korea, Russia and Japan. There are usually several of these groups um, and VIU uses these sessions as a preparation ahead of an actual physical mobility. So for their virtual exchange, we meet weekly over four weeks to discuss various topics. So identity, religion, migration, sexuality and gender. The idea being that the students meet online and build relationships and some of them actually travel to Venice and they end up meeting in person, having a pizza together and sometimes even sharing a flat. So the students love these sessions and although we upload material onto Moodle for them each week, they actually love just showing up and seeing each other from, from week to week. It's really lovely to watch them grow and that's the sort of joy of being a facilitator. Next slide, please, Sarah. Just take um, a few moments to read this slide. I'll just give you a few minutes. This is some feedback from uh, a past virtual exchange. So this exchange involved the US and Egypt, two countries with possibly very different views on homosexuality, but you'll note that the exchange was really focusing on AIDS and therefore was a medical exchange researching how these two countries dealt with and treated AIDS patients. But inevitably, the homosexual aspect came into the discussions, which caused some initial difficulties. But as you can see from the feedback with the help of facilitated sessions, um, this issue was overcome and the topic was approached in a way that was acceptable to everyone. So they found some common ground. Next slide, please, Sarah. And again, um, I'll give you a few moments. This was, uh, the, the, the context was history and um, it brought together, and it's had several iterations. It brings together Romania and Hungary, and the focus is a particular treaty a hundred years ago, which had very different impact on each country. One country gained territory, one country lost territory, and, and it's an opportunity for these students to see things from a different perspective. And so history lends itself to perspective. So it was um, also nurturing um, soft skills such as teamwork and, and time management. And there was even a language aspect because they were practicing their English as well. And the final one for me, Sara, again, um, you'll see how participants appreciate the opportunity to explore a topic from a different perspective. And you can see this student wasn't able to travel on an Erasmus mobility, but nevertheless managed to gain something significant from the virtual exchange experience in terms of cross-cultural understanding and learning. So in this case, a complement to an actual mobility. Um, thank you very much. Um, I'm passing back to my colleague, Sara. Okay, thank you. And just uh, to conclude, before opening up to Q&A, uh, what we would like to uh, give you is an idea about what you can do, uh, literally, in the, in the call for proposals for virtual exchange, which has 
been launched uh, by the European Commission uh, within the framework of the Erasmus Plus program. Um, I won't focus, though, on, on the structure of the um, call for proposals. I won't focus on the budget. I will focus um, on, on the strategy and on the activities uh, you can do. And um, my, my focus will also be on the higher education sector. As you know, the call is open for the youth sector as well. But uh, I mean, since our core activity is train, uh, to train um, staff in the field of higher education. Uh, this will be also uh, the focus of my, my, my presentation now. And to do that, I need to uh, remind uh, us all of the background of the European policies, of the European uh, policies behind Erasmus Plus for the next uh, seven years, so 21 to 27. I mean, the key uh, focus is on on offering something which is more inclusive at higher education level and on green and digital transitions. Bearing that in mind, this call has a specific objectives which can be declined as follows. So first, encouraging intercultural dialogue with partner countries and increased tolerance through what? Through what we have defined before as virtual exchange, people to people interactions. Second, promote various types of virtual exchange. Just um, as you might have um, heard from Anna before, we speak about ready-made and co-designed virtual exchange uh, projects. This is part of the training course as a complement to Erasmus Plus physical mobility. Enhance critical thinking and media literacy is another uh, call objective. Foster the development of digital and soft skills also in the light of enhancing employability. Promote citizenship and the common values of freedom, tolerance, and non-discrimination through education and strengthen the youth dimension. And this is the only reference I'll make to uh, the youth se sector. And this is all going to take place with uh, the top priority regions which have been identified in the Digital Education Action Plan 2, which are the Western Balkans and the neighborhood regions of the Eastern Partnership, the Southern Mediterranean and Southern Sub-Saharan Africa. Why did I give you again these call of depth objectives which can, you can find in the call for proposals as well? Because this leads me to focus on the activities you can plan within the call for proposals. Uh, I will focus on, on three kinds of activities to give you an idea of how you can link what we have told you about with the activities you can actually do. You can either focus on online facilitated discussions between students, training, you can raise awareness about virtual exchange through dedicated training for virtual ex for university staff, be it teaching or administrative staff. You can focus on interactive open online courses. That said, I would like to give you an idea, some tips of what I would recommend you to do uh, before you submit your proposal in 20 days, in yes, 20 days, because the deadline will be on the 22nd of February, as you know. So, and I would like to start with the first tip, which is try to be as specific as possible. So narrow your scope and aims. Out of the various activities you can do, either choose, to whether you want to raise awareness in partner countries through bespoke trainings, for example, or whether you want to work on virtual exchange projects. And in that case, choose whether you want to focus on the ready-made approach. So on offering um, virtual exchange projects, which have already been created by professional organizations in the field of virtual exchange and offer them to students of the consortium universities, or choose and opt for designing your own virtual exchange project within your network of institutions involved. Or, and very much that uh, you can focus on who you want to train, why you want to train them, and how. So in this case, we're speaking about those of you who would like to focus on the training bit. 
the training activity. And even after choosing which path you want to take, I would like to invite you to consider that the whole Erasmus Plus call for proposals is, um, uh, cent is um, uh, centered around key European EU uh, policy interests and topics, such as the environment, social security, industrial and trade policy. And it would be interesting to consider narrowing down your um, virtual exchange activities, uh, focusing on, for example, the environment, on, on, on uh, green, the Green Deal, for example, and so on. Um, and, and you can look for existing virtual exchanges offered by professionals in virtual exchange. There are a few organizations in Europe which we have been partnering with in Erasmus Plus Virtual Exchange, um, which can offer and provide these uh, ready-made options, such as IUs, which were mentioned before. And I, I would say that this is uh, my last tip. And I know that uh, it is not enough to submit an application, but the idea I wanted to convey you is that um, um, it is very, the, the, the time is now for you to act. After these three years, we ended the Erasmus Plus virtual exchange at, in December 2020. And while that tender was for a consortium to identify the path, the virtual exchange path in Europe, with this call, the European Union is explicitly asking for you to play a role within the field of virtual exchange. So if I were you, I would, I would give it a try. And I would, I would try to see what your role can be in these, in these uh, challenging and enriching uh, frame. That said, um, this is um, the, 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 our website where, and I would like to invite my colleagues to share the link in the chat, where you can find more information about the open tool training courses and about the bespoke training options as well. And, and I would like to end our presentation by um, inviting you to fill out this satisfaction survey, which is very important for us to know which topics may be interesting for you um, so that we can deal with other uh, topics in the next future, in the next rounds of free webinars. And I would like now to open um, to question and answers. So in case you are willing to pose a question, uh, you can easily uh, take the floor now and I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, or if you feel more comfortable in sharing your question in the chat, feel free to do so. Uh, you can even I mean, um, uh, let us um, look at your face if you wish um, and okay. and switch on your mic in case you are willing to ask a question or share a comment. Um, Hello, uh, I, can I ask something? I yes, of course. I can uh, turn on my uh, video because it's disabled, this function, but I'm just going to ask, uh, could you just say briefly what this uh, call for proposals, oh, maybe now I can do that, uh, what this call for proposals, I'm, I'm uh, an Erasmus coordinator from Poland, from Jelenia Góra, a small city in the southwest. Um, um, our Ukrainian partners have asked us to uh, to submit a proposal, but because it was so new to me, uh, I didn't. And um, I was wondering if you could just brief us or me uh, what cause of proposals 
are open is it just for for eastern i know that there is one for eastern countries for african as you mentioned but i just don't remember them all yeah or is it also for program countries uh, i'm sure i will be able to get all these details but maybe you have it all straight in your head and can explain it quickly yeah and i i do apologize with all of you because i didn't want to go into details into the call that's why of i course. gave some details yes. for granted but thank you for posing this question um i mean uh, these uh two calls for proposal it's one call with two sub calls for proposals mm -hmm. they have been opened uh they were opened in autumn in sub late september or october by the european union mm -hmm. they are part of the erasmus plus program yet um these applications must be submitted electronically via the uh, funder tender page so there yeah. is a different oh, process no, yeah. okay and uh, if you have a look at the uh, calls for proposals you will mm -hmm. see that uh, the consortium requirements require at least two institutions from mm -hmm. two european program countries mm -hmm. I, I i speak about european countries but you know better than me what program the program country. countries mm -hmm. are and at least two institutions from partner countries which yes. are eligible and these partner countries are western balkans and there is a specific call one of this, these two sub calls mm -hmm. is for the western balkans uh -huh. the other one is for uh, the neighborhood regions eastern partnerships um uh -huh. mediterranean so mm -hmm. sub-saharan africa plus uh -huh. all in the same sub call uh, uh, sub-saharan africa so Africa as a whole uh, continent. And uh -huh. um, so, for, for instance, there must be balance. Another requirement is that there must be balance in the composition between partner countries and program countries. If you add another program country, you need to add another partner country. If you uh -huh. have three institutions, um, you need to have three. So there, there must be balance. Be and, and the way I see it, is um, a way to empower. Uh, I, I literally believe that the main aim behind this call was to empower higher education institutions um, to uh, take the lead in this field of virtual exchange. And, and I know that, of course, uh, many of you might have no experience with virtual exchange or no experience in training with virtual exchange. And in that case, I mean, uh, we are also available to support. Uh, we 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 are we will participate as a subcontractor. So there is no need for you to decide now. We want to opt for uni collaboration as a partner. Um, you can even even turn to us later on once you have succeeded in your in your application, mm -hmm. or you can uh, you can ask your Ukrainian partner, for example, if they have experience in that, and you can work on designing your own virtual exchange course together i mean and focus more on on the virtual exchange course you you are going to deliver to your your students mm -hmm. so there are various options and mm -hmm. um, i don't know whether i have clarified yes it. yes uh, yes because i asked for some details you know about the calls for proposals but i can also have a look again and i also found out that there will be another uh, our national agency was informing us that in september there will be another deadline yes it will, yeah. will it be do you know the same because now it's kind of short no. now <laughs> yeah, uh -huh. as far as i can i can uh tell you my perceptions at w what i got from the European Commission, what I understood. This call was mainly aimed at after the tender, which has been quite successful, uh, the Erasmus Plus virtual exchange tender, where there was a consortium of ins institutions and organizations being professional in the field of virtual exchange, offering mm -hmm. these activities. So after that has ended, the main idea was for the European Commission to empower higher education institutions first, with, a call, with the current call for proposals. As of September, there should be uh, autumn for the next call, there should be a shift and the change even in the way the consortium is built, in the conditions. And we presume that in that case, projects will be, the call for proposals will be closer to projects as we do understand now. So um, if I can 
uh, I, I think there will be scope for more collaboration between various uh, kinds of institutions mm -hmm. in the field of virtual exchange. So I presume it will be slightly different from the current call for proposals. I don't know, though, whether the uh, way to submit proposals will be the same, but as far as I have understood, that should be facilitated too, uh, because as you might have seen, I mean, the requirements are quite strict and there are a lot of documents which are asked for institutions to provide, especially for non-higher education institutions in this call. So I have understood that these will be eased in the next call for applications. But we may have another webinar by then. So <laughs> okay, well, okay. that was for my question. I give the floor to some other people. Thank you. Um, I um, this silence might mean that we have been very clear. I don't think this is the case, uh, but uh, while you think about your potential questions, we might also share our email addresses in the chat in the meantime. So in, in case you don't have any question now, but you would like to pose a question afterwards, feel free to contact us. And I, I forgot maybe to say that we work a lot with European, European universities as well. So coming back to the bespoke training options, we have been offering and we are offering bespoke trainings to European universities as such, willing to design virtual exchange projects within their framework and their network. Same holds true for higher education networks, uh, willing to uh, work into this field together. Just to point out in the chat that uh, somebody's looking for partners, Anna uh, or Palka looking for partners. So please feel free to share your details with each other in private chat as well, or in the main chat as you wish. Thank you, Anna, for correcting the typo. <laughs> I left the N off. <laughs> and in the meantime, I also wanted to add that we, as Uni Collaboration, participate in European projects as well. And we are currently participating in quite successful strategic partnerships like Frames Project, dealing with training on virtual exchange, the PENSA project, which is a project designed by a, a civic um, European university, um, the VAMOS Capacity Building Project, working on virtual exchange in the field of sustainable development in Latin America, more specifically Brazil and Honduras, and uh, the GoDigip project focusing on virtual exchange in joint programs. So if you want to have a look at the projects, you can also visit our website where we provide information about these various projects. Um, can I just check that we will share the link to the slides with the people who've joined us today? Yeah. That they can access the links in them. We will, um, after um, this webinar, we will share with you the slides uh, with uh, we, um, you as participants and yeah. And the recording probably as well, um, Sarah, yeah. I'm going to stop recording now.